one of the oldest questions in philosophy is whether there's actually anything out there. I shall qualify the term out there shortly. But, you know, the naive assumption is that we live in a body and outside our body in space and time there's a whole pile of stuff going on and we take in those sense impressions and construct our reality from those sense impressions. And there are people who believe that actually all there is is stuff that's out there, we get the sense impressions and then we build our knowledge from that. And if you can't sense it then it doesn't exist as far as these people are concerned. This came to us ahead sort of in the 17th and 18th century with people like Locke and Hobbes. It was an English movement in the main and they were the realists, the empiricists. They just believed that everything was um, essentially detected by our senses and we built knowledge from it. But there was a counter movement uh, the idealists who believed that actually everything was in our heads to you know, essentially put it in a, a fairly gross way but a belief that everything was mind and a character called George Berkeley who was a bishop, Bishop Berkeley was probably the leading person in this movement and then you had people in between those two extremes and Schopenhauer wasn't total a total idealist neither was Kant, but they did lean towards that. Now what's the significance of all this? Well the significance of it is, is that Kant was really the man who um, reconciled the whole thing, to, to some extent anyway. And he, re he reveals some very interesting things. One of, his <coughs> one of his main ideas was that we have actually two kinds of knowledge. One that is derived from the so-called outside world, empirical knowledge. So if you've never opened your eyes then you will not know that the sky is blue. The only way you can know the sky is blue by is by looking at it. But equally he said that we have inbuilt knowledge. It's part of the structure of our minds if you like or our consciousness. And he claimed that time and space were actually two forms of that kind of knowledge. Um, I haven't got the time to really to go into why he reasoned all of that, but you can you can work it out for yourself to some extent because everything you perceive is within space and time. Those things do not exist out there. They are properties of your consciousness, and they are the framework within which you view the world. Now you may think, well, you know, does it really matter? Well, actually, it turns out it matters a great deal. Because <coughs> if we really have space within our consciousness or within our mind, it would indicate that maybe we have some inherent understanding of space that is not determined by um, empirical reality, in other words, determined by our senses. And it turns out that this is the case. And it's not a small thing either. The whole of pure mathematics is based on a priori knowledge, as Kant would say. Knowledge that is inbuilt. So we can form the idea of a triangle or a circle or much more abstract things. And the example I'm going to give is that of something called uh, Riemann geometry. When I was at university, you know, I foolishly <laughs> foolishly went to study uh, some of these things and Riemann geometry is what's called a differential geometry I won't go into all of that but it's just a very very beautiful form of geometry that had no application when it was created uh, Riemann just created it because it was there to create and he had a, an intuitive understanding of how space could be composed of curves a space could be composed composed of curves instead of the normal straight lines. If you've done any kind of elementary mathematics you will know about Cartesian coordinates. Anybody who draws a graph <coughs> typically draws a vertical axis and a horizontal axis and they're both straight lines 
and that's the way we measure what is happening within that space that we've created by those straight lines and maybe you draw you know, some kind of graph in that um, in that system. Well Riemann had the idea that maybe the axes aren't straight lines, maybe they're curves. Simple idea. Uh, the mathematics is a bit hairy but uh, the idea is sort of straightforward enough. And he produced this in the 19th century and it was left alone until Albert Einstein came along. And Albert Einstein had a beautiful, beautiful thought experiment one day. Not based on any kind of experimental data. He just said to himself, I wonder if the force you feel in your back when you're taking off in an aeroplane, it wouldn't have been an aeroplane in his day, but you know, whatever. The force, you, so inertial uh, force, that sense of being pushed in the back when you're on an aeroplane, or if you're in a lift, being the acceleration in a lift, whether that force on your feet is actually the same as the force of gravity, because when you stand on the ground you feel obviously the force of gravity. Uh, what you actually feel is the resistance from the earth pushing against the gravity. And he just said, are these two things the same? Is gravity and uh, inertial force the same? And he called this his principle of equivalence. And from the principle of, of equivalence, he, he started to develop his ideas around gravity and space and time. And he needed a mathematical tool in which to model that. And the mathematical tool was Riemann geometry. He didn't know it at the time. He employed the help of some mathematicians and they said, oh, we think what you're looking for is Riemann geometry. And sure enough, it turned out that this geometry that was devised half a century earlier was exactly what he was looking for. And as you probably know, general relativity from Einstein is now the accepted model of how gravity works. And in fact, what gravity is. Gravity is a distortion of space and time. So those curved axes serve very well to describe a curved uh, three-dimensional manifold or you know, whatever term you want to use, a three-dimensional, well, it's, it's actually four-dimensional because you throw time in there as well, but you know, so th it uses curved axes. And general relativity <coughs> has been proved, there's no question that it's um, actually showing how gravity works and how we can forecast the effects of gravity. So black holes, which also have been observed now, uh, you observe them from their effects on the things that are around them. Black holes are predicted by general relativity, space-time distortions are predicted by general relativity. And we see all of these things happening. And yeah, the amazing thing is that none of this was originally built on what you might call empirical knowledge. It was just a guy called uh, Riemann doing some maths and Einstein having this idea, oh, is the force on my back the same as the force on my feet when I stand on the ground? And uh, he, so he worked on that basis. And then, sure enough, out comes one of the most beautiful and important ideas from the whole of um, physics. I'm going to finish this by just talking about Spinoza for a moment and as you may or may not know Einstein was a fan of Spinoza. In fact he said my god is the god of Spinoza and he wrote what is actually a very embarrassing love letter to Spinoza. He was so uh, enamored with him <coughs> that he wrote a kind of letter saying how wonderful is this man and all that kind of thing. So why was Einstein, who was nobody's fool, so enamoured with Spinoza? Well, Spinoza said that actually people live in two dimensions, if you like. One is the dimension of your physical reality, he called it extension. And the other one is the dimension of thought. And the two are in no way connected with each other. <laughs> They're quite separate. And when we start to look at these ideas of, you know, do we have within us inherent knowledge that is 
in no way related to empirical knowledge then at that point we can start to wonder how much knowledge there is in there in our minds because this is not an area where anyone is investigating particularly you know physicists are hooked on the idea that if you can't measure it it's not important and yet most of the important ideas in physics have nothing to do with measurement things like wave particle duality I'm not going to go into that but you know an electron for example sometimes behaves like it's a little bullet a little particle and other times it be behaves like it's a wave so the way a ripple spreads out on the surface of water um, a, a number of things in quantum mechanics are not explainable in terms of just pure physical manifestation and Einstein discovered things like time and space dilation, time dilation so someone goes shooting away from you at a very high speed and they come back you may have aged, what well, I don't know, maybe a week they've aged 50 years or it could be the other way around depending on who does the acceleration but anyway that's the um, <coughs> those are the weird things that happen and physicists most physicists have no handle on that they just plug the equations in and work the whole thing out without giving it much thought but actually once you start to look at the whole realm of ideas and thought then you start to see that we have within us knowledge that does not require um, experience for it to be built up mathematics being the premier example of that and there's also logic and you know, I could go on f about this for a long time but the bottom line in it all is that man has really not investigated the knowledge that is um, a part of his being, a part of his mind, his thought we've been preoccupied with what's out there and in truth there is no out there the out there is, actually, is really just part of our consciousness and so there are whole worlds and universes to be dis discovered in the world of thought and right now we're just like well what can I compare us with when we're not even amoebas <laughs> we're pre amoeba in terms of the realization of the power of our thought and the world of thought and on that note I'll finish <laughs>